I want to uh, begin by asking, does anybody have a birthday on the 29th of February? No? It's all right. We've got a sister-in-law who has a birthday on that day, and of course that happened this week, and she feels ripped off. It's a bit like people having birthdays on Christmas Day, isn't it? But I also had a birthday this week. And I don't know uh, about uh, each of you, but it seems to me that as I get older, one of the things I seem to be doing more of is reflecting on what has been happening in my life over the past years. To think of some of the memories of people with whom I've had the pleasure to associate the things that I have done. And this time, 51 years ago, I happened to be in the United States. See, I was uh, an exchange student and uh, my host family were a wonderful Christian couple who lived just outside of Philadelphia. And they had a, a young man who was a, a marathon runner. His name was Peter Livingston Fry. And the reason his middle name was Livingston was the fact that his mum and dad were missionaries in Thailand. But Pete used to often be out running uh, races, riding his bike, uh, and would call in as he was doing this, because where we lived was on a country back road, so there wasn't a lot of traffic. But as I was thinking about the memory of Peter, I was also reminded of this particular story that I want to bring to us this morning, written by uh, a writer whose name was Steve Kosky. He writes this, last year I decided to run a marathon. My first training run was the end of our street and I thought I was going to die. <laughs> Every day I tried to go a little further and before I knew it, 10 months later, I was at the starting line of the Disney World Marathon in Orlando. I was running along and a 79 year old man with one arm passed me. That's okay, I said to myself, just run your own race. But then an eight month pregnant woman passed me. She gave birth a few weeks later, not surprisingly, and named her son Miles. <laughs> By about the third mile, I started to run with a group of people who were running my pace. In this group was a woman named Grace, who I discovered was 63 years old. Now, on this particular day, and as is the case when lots of these uh, events take place, there are actually three races in one. There was the marathon, 26.2 miles, about 42 kilometres, the half marathon, and a five-mile fun run. There were three different starting lines because they wanted everyone to finish at the one place. I discovered in talking with Grace that she had the wrong information and went to the wrong starting line. <laughs> she thought she was running the fun run. In fact, she had never run more than five miles in her life. I had to break the news to her that when she hit five miles, she did have a little further to go. Grace's attitude was amazing. She said, I'm here, so I'll run as far as I can. Now, when it came to the stations where you could get drinks of water, I chose to walk, but Grace was afraid that if she stopped, she wouldn't get going again, so she passed me too. I crossed the finish line in a little over four hours and 30 minutes, but I had to find Grace to see if she'd finished. There were 10,000 runners competing, so it took me a little while to find her, but I found her lying on the ground, unable to move. She finished in four hours and 15 minutes, and she'd never run more than five miles in her life. She had a sad expression on her face, so I asked her, what's wrong? She said, about the 23rd mile mark, I knew I was going to finish, and it was like my life flashed before my eyes. I can do this. I looked back on my life and began to wonder about all the ways that I have limited myself by what I thought I couldn't do. But then 
a sheepish grin appeared and she added, but let me tell you, I'm also looking forward and I'm wondering what's next. Grace taught me a valuable lesson that day. It's not who you are that holds you back, it's who you think you are not. For Steve and for Grace, for the 79 year old man and the pregnant mum, this race was a challenge. It involved taking a risk. Anything could have happened in the course of their running. Collapse, a heart attack, the birth of a baby, and yet they were prepared to give it a go. Some of you may be familiar with the name Tony Campolo, famous Christian writer and professor from Eastern College in the United States. In his message, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming, he talks about a survey in which people over 90 were asked, if you could live your life over, what three things would you do differently? And the top three answers were these. We would laugh more, we would travel more, and we would risk more. God is a risk taker. It was his love that caused him to sacrifice his son on the cross, anticipating that there would be people who would respond to this most gracious of all acts, thus entering into a relationship with him. But as we saw in our home group study on Wednesday night, God's risk also involved people hearing the message and saying no. Becoming a Christian, as we know, involves taking a risk. When we, by faith, invite the Lord Jesus into our lives, we are placing ourselves at his disposal. How is it possible to live by faith and not by our own skills and abilities? Well, as has been said earlier this morning, it's simply a matter of trust. God will not put us in a position where he is not able to be with us. Risk taking is about taking God at his word. And he says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. The Apostle Paul in our Philippians reading says, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Forgetting what is behind means just that. Whatever we have done in our life before we responded to the good news of Jesus has been dealt with by God once and for all. The slate has been wiped clean, the file has been erased. And in this race called life, we are to face forward anticipating what lies ahead, ever stretching, ever reaching. This was a concept that was drummed into me when I was running cross country. We were told, pass the person in front of you and don't look back, look for the next person in line that you can pass and that will help you to keep as moving forward towards the finishing line to risk for God. In fact, to run the race of life requires determination. It requires an attitude that is resolute. And as we walk by faith and not by sight, our living for Christ is an adventure. And research shows that those who pursue new adventures through life stay younger, think better and achieve greater enjoyment. Now most of us I'm sure at some stage or other in our lives have moved. It's not easy leaving behind family and friends, the comfort of the familiar. And as we were looking at the floods in Brisbane 
earlier this week, Helen and I were talking about the fact that two of the places where we live there in Jindalee and Kenmore were both underwater. And if we'd been there, then we would have been facing the same dilemma as so many thousands of other people have. But as we go through life and deal with the experiences that come our way, we know that we have a great God in whom we can trust. In talking about the future, Chuck Swindle sums it up this way. He says, the plan is progress, not perfection. The past is over, forget it. The future holds out hope, reach for it. Now, Helen and I have spent many years living in the country as uh, my time as a teacher or certainly as a minister. And perhaps those of you who have experienced country life could also identify that people who live in the country understand perhaps that city people think and act a little bit differently from us in a number of ways. I don't know if you've ever stopped and thought about this, but while we hear a lot about go-getting and taking a punt in all manner of ways, I would suggest that for people who are farmers, who generally have a reputation for being conservative, they take far more risks than do city people. Isn't the bottom line in farming about risk? The seed that is sown, the weather, the market prices, the reliability of machinery. There is so much at stake. And I was reminded of that again this week when I was talking to my brother over on Air Peninsula. He's over there for a number of weeks because his property, going back a few weeks ago when we had all that rain, he had more than 200 millimetres. And he's there rearranging his fence lines and re-rubbling his drive and replanting trees. All sorts of things that need to be done. It's part of what living on the land is all about. And I guess one of those things when we think about that, and we've seen it certainly on our TVs, is the, the mateship, the community spirit, then it can exist when the going gets tough. Let's not forget too, the importance of the church we are a corporate body, the body of Christ. And I think often we've been done a bit of a disservice, particularly in some of the songs that we were singing a few years back when we were talking about uh, me and my and I and the nature that the church is the body of Christ. We together have a corporate identity. We are much more than a bunch of individuals. And as such, though, God calls us to mission. He wants us out in the paddocks that's the community, the mission field, not stuck here in our holy huddle. John chapter 20 and verse 21 has been called the riskiest verse in the Bible. And this is what it says. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. That little word as means uh, in the same way. So God sends us out as his ambassadors with the good news of Jesus Christ, seed to sow in the hearts of people. I don't know about you, but I am awed to think that God considers me as his workmate. And as verses six and seven of 1 Corinthians chapter three remind us, he is the one responsible for the harvest. These words read, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he nor plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. And I'm very thankful for that. As a church, as the body of Christ, are we willing to accept the challenge? Are we prepared to risk? If we're not, then we're going to die. 
And I'm not too sure that God is going to be all that impressed about that. We are called to be ambassadors of hope. We possess a hope that many in our wider society don't have these days. And we possess this hope because where there is no risk, there is no witness. And where there is no witness, there is no gospel. And where there is no gospel, there is no hope. And without hope, people die. In the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, we have the story of the prophet who was entrusted with the message of God to his people to turn from their sinful ways. Jeremiah prophesied to the people during the reign of the last five kings of Judah from about 627 into the five, 580s. But as he went, he went with the promise of God. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Jeremiah was a risk taker. He trusted God and so he stood up against the people of Judah with the courage of God, a one man resistance movement against the status quo. Zedekiah the king was the last of these kings of Judah, was a caretaker because he didn't challenge the evil of his people's ways. He heard what Jeremiah said but he didn't want to rock the boat. And ultimately, he became the undertaker of his people as they were carried off to Babylon in 586 BC and the city of Jerusalem was destroyed. God wants us to be like Jeremiah, trusting in him, prepared to have a go, daring adventure, attempting new challenges. Now I'm a bit of a person who loves history and I have a number of heroes and not that he's on the top of my list but we'll be familiar with um, Teddy Roosevelt who was the American president back in the early 1900s. He was famous for setting up the national park system in the United States and he was also famous for his saying that said, walk softly but wield a big stick. I want to read to you this quote that he gave. He says, it is not the critic who counts, not the person who points out where the doer of deed could have done better. And we certainly have so much of that these days, don't we, with social media. The credit belongs to the person who is actually in the arena having a go. Whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again, who knows the great enthusiasms, the devotions, and spends himself or herself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end of triumph of high achievement and at worst at least fails while daring greatly so that his or her place shall never be with those cold timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat it was william carey the great missionary to india who said attempt great things for god expect great things from god May this be our prayer as we press on being risk takers for him. Let's pray. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who is the same yesterday, today and forever. That you are a God who through your sacrifice of your Son and for your love has given us a hope for those who believe in him as Saviour and Lord. And regardless of how old we might be, we know that in your kingdom there is always something that we can do for you. That you are the one who gives us the strength and the enabling power. Who gives us the joy when we try those little things and we see them come off because it's your Holy Spirit that is at work. So Father, may we be risk takers. 
May we be encouraged to continue to step out and have a go as we seek to be your people in this place. For this is our prayer and the desire of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Our final song then this morning is Men of Faith and Women Too, Rise Up and Sing. As we uh, go forth then into this week, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace has given us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Amen. <laughs>